Okay. Thanks, Ben um, and uh, Travis for hosting me. And also, I want to thank uh, Matt Post, uh, who invited me, but even, even though he couldn't be here. Um, so I'm very excited to be here uh, again. Uh, a few years ago, I, I stopped by, so I definitely recognize some faces and uh, look forward to meeting uh, many uh, of you. So uh, like Ben said, uh, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we have been working on uh, at Microsoft Research on uh, NLP for genomic medicine. Um, so uh, I will start by sort of like a computational biology uh, agenda that uh, we, we're trying to combine all this high throughput omics data to try to uh, produce actionable information that could have a medical impact. Like, for example, identify disease gene for cancer and prioritize drug combination. So one of the sort of uh, the key uh, core component here is that we want to kind of build this kind of progressive model based on the knowledge base um, to that, that are aware of the, how the gene interact with each other and with the drug, and, and that's how we construct the probabilistic model. And so that motivates um, uh, a more standard NLP agenda, which is how can we extract all this knowledge uh, from, from the literature. And in particularly, I will um, sh uh, show you uh, one bottleneck in this process, obviously, is the standard machine learning challenge, is how do you get the annotated examples. So here, what we are trying to do is to using the incomplete existing manually curated knowledge base as sort of a bootstrap uh, as an indirect supervision. And we develop uh, this uh, thing we call grounded semantic parsing to try to leverage that to automatically learn uh, extractor and then parse the new text. So I start by telling you a little bit about um, this exciting uh, wor uh, uh, moment in the genomic world. Um, so we are actually in this uh, very sort of disruptive uh, time. Uh, so here is uh, the graph you probably will see a lot of time later on. So the x-axis are the year, the y-axis is uh, like how much does it cost to sequence a human genome. So at the 15 years ago when, we, when the Human Genome Project concluded, we spent like a, a few billion dollars with tens of countries and over a decade to just get through a, a, couple, a, a few genomes. Uh, last year, 2014, is actually the first time we can now sequence the human genome for uh, about $1,000 um, uh, with the Illumina X10. And so in a few years, uh, it, it will probably be like 100 bucks or 10 bucks, so everybody can get them. And also, it's not just the DNA uh, for the genome, but you can also get messenger RNA, you can get uh, methylation, histone modification, so all of them are sort of your binary code, your machine code uh, about the disease and health, right? And, and they provide you with a rich multi-model. Uh, um, uh, they are definitely correlated, as you can see later on, but they also provide you with a lot of uh, orthogonal information. So, and people collectively call this panomics. Um, so having a lot of this uh, high throughput data obviously is uh, uh, a very exciting uh, thing, but Again, they are just like machine codes. Until you can translate them into some sort of actionable information, they are of very little value. Now, one of the sort of the area for great value proposition, obviously, is this precision medicine. And the dream here is that so traditionally, so rather than doing the traditional way, like trying to figure out a blockbuster drug that can be applicable to everybody, let's try to figure out what happened actually at the individual level, what gone wrong in that case, and then try to develop a uh, treatment that specifically target that. So um, here is like a poster trial of a recently developed cancer drugs uh, that specifically target this gene called BRAF uh, in this very late stage uh, already spread uh, uh, skin cancer. So you can see that the guy is actually, uh, normally he wouldn't last too long. But with this drug, almost miraculously, in less than four months, the cancer completely melted away, and then with almost uh, uh, no side effect. So this is exactly sort of like the dream scenario we want to shoot for. We want to figure out all this kind of targeted medicine that pre precisely destroy the can uh, cancer. Unfortunately, so this gives us some hope, but unfortunately at this point, uh, this is sort of the norm, uh, rather than the exception. Almost inevitably, the cancer figure out some way to get by 
um, and, and later on you can see a little bit uh, why. So, so, so we are not quite done yet. But this is sort of the exciting time for research, right? It, because you sort of call a glimpse of the future, you start to realize that this might be doable, but uh, also there are lots of things we could contribute. So in cancer, one, in cancer using genomics, one of the standard way is that you could, you could look at the tumor uh, genome, and then you can compare it to, your, to the normal cells, and then you can look at the differences. And uh, we, we understand now that uh, basically the majority of the secret of the cancer lies in these differences. So, so, so this is a very good point to start. But unfortunately, there could be hundreds of mutations. And if you compare two cancer patients, like even two lung cancer patients, the mutated gene might have almost no overlap. And we also understand that a lot of these mutations, hundreds of thousands, they are really the result of the cancer rather than the cause. Um, so, so, the, so the million dollar question is, uh, can we figure out those handful of drivers that actually kick off the cancer and then precisely uh, target them? So this actually uh, is actually a good case in point to think about how, uh, why genomic is such a disruption force in, in, in biomedicine. So traditionally, uh, biologists could make their career by starting like one gene or one pathway at a time, and uh, so they could make their whole career based on that. And they re don't really uh, need a lot of help from NLP, right? They could read all those papers about that gene, they can memorize them more, they can construct their mental model with just a small uh, neighbor network. But now all of a sudden, you have all these 20,000 genes, and also in cancer, you know that some, it's a handful of genes that cause a problem, but you don't know uh, what among those 20,000 are doing that. So all of a sudden, you're sort of forced to consider all these genes. And now we, re we are basically facing two big bottlenecks, because one of them is like nobody can really memorize even a fraction of uh, the knowledge about all this gene. But more importantly is that with all this gene, with all this knowledge, all these connections, and how to do reasoning actually become a major, major bottleneck, and we need some way to automate that. And that's actually an area we could potentially uh, contribute to. So one of the sort of concrete scenario to, to keep in mind is something called the tumor molecular bore. Um, so, so genomic has already been started using in a couple areas, cancer being one of them. And so people typically will start forming this board, like 10, 20 specialists. And they will, uh, one patient comes in, here are the 500 mutation. What do we know about them? Go to the PubMed, do some search. Do you know a friend who knows some of this mutation? So I, I have seen in a couple of sessions of this board, it's very, very labor intensive. You can spend tens of hours on a patient, and often they don't come to a definite solution. And also, it's really just scratching the surface. Right now, they only have the bandwidth to look at even just single mutation. And it's quite well known that things can actually work synergistically. So, and last year alone, also another figure that came in mind is that just in US, there were like 1.6 million uh, new cancer patients, half a, more than half a million deaths. So this kind of approach obviously could, could not scale. And what we really want is to somehow uh, automate some of this process. I imagining even just automate a little bit of some of these processes, develop this kind of decision support system. Like even if you can cut like 10 hours to five hours, you already double their productivity. So that's sort of like uh, uh, our dream uh, application scenario. So for example, one of the things that, that the, the oncologists or biologists will spend a lot of time on is to go to the PubMed and look for the information about how genes interact with each other. Because gene are not, uh, genes are not loners, they really work with each other. And here is actually an actual fragment of a pathway. Uh, you can think of it basically as a hypergraph. So each node is a, a, a bunch of uh, gene product like protein, protein complex, uh, or maybe RNA and so forth. And then each hyper edge is uh, sort of like um, uh, interaction among these gene products. So it could be like activation, so some Pro, uh, complex may switch on uh, the transcription of a gene. Uh, some uh, other protein will inhibit the activity of another proteins and so forth. So um, why this kind of pathway would be important? Well, uh, because when you look at any of these complex disease, like cancer being one of them, but also diabetes, Alzheimer's, and so forth, 
they are almost inevitably stem from perturbation of multiple pathways. So here is the famous uh, uh, um, cancer hallmarks, uh, uh, few hallmarks of cancer. You can loosely think about it as like imagining there is a cancer grammar, right? So there is a, this CFG rule that says that to be a cancer, you need to resist the, the temptation to commit suicide. You need to induce blood vessel. You need to keep replicating and so forth. And each of them is like a non-terminal, right? Each of this module or pathway is like a non-terminal. You can have multiple ways to perturb this terminal to diverge from the normal. And this whole process can go nested. So we can now imagining when you get down to the level of individual genes, the statistics become so convoluted. And it's very difficult to just you know, look at a simple statistic and unravel the situation. So this is why we, it's very hard to identify the drivers and so forth. And by the way, Hopkins is actually like one of the really pioneer place to study this kind of cancer genetic, like in particular like Burr, Wagenstein, and other people. And, and so I, I'm kind of so also very excited for that reason um, to talk something here. Um, but also imagining even if you figure out that there is this uh, driver pathway and you confirm that this is the driver in this case, and even if you figure out there is a drug, right, to block this driver pathway. Cancer turns out to be incredibly robust. So they have several ways to evade this uh, attack against them. For example, they could potentially automatically involve an alternative pathway. So this is actually a real case um, to compensate for the activity of the block pathway. And also, by the time and any cancer, any solid tumor is detected, it's, uh, it already has billions of cells. And it is actually a very rich ecosystem, have many subspecies, and some of those subtypes actually could be resistant to, to the treatment already. So if you figure out a drug, you wipe out the primary clone, and then the subclone, actually some of those resistant clones can take off. So those are all the uh, reasons why cancer actually often uh, just relapse. And, and this, is all, this is really also um, uh, signifying why the pathway is important. So this sort of motivated uh, approach to say, let's put all of these things uh, together in a joint model, joint probability model, right? So think about all these things that you could measure, put them as an observable variable. And then you could also have tons of latent variables uh, which you would love to, you know, uh, uh, know the answer, but often you cannot directly measure. For example, okay, if I have a mutation, is it functional, right? Does it actually do anything? Um, and if I put a drug, I normally know the direct target, what's the impact on the direct target. But what happened with all the indirect downstream in the pathway graph, right? What happened with the target's neighbor and neighbor's neighbor and so forth? So you can put all those in, uh, capture them in a latent variable uh, model. So now, um, so you can imagine something like this. So you can turn this knowledge into the model by, so here horizontally, this is just like uh, biology 101, uh, the central dogma. So we know that from DNA, uh, we will, uh, uh, it will get transcribed into a messenger RNA. Messenger RNA get translated into protein and they get uh, modified chemically to become active. But also we have this sort of horizontal line like that uh, between different gene products, just much, very much like what you saw in that pathway graph, right? So what some protein could serve as a switch to turn on another uh, messenger RNA, and then some other protein can turn on uh, another protein, and so forth. So those are like the pathway knowledge. And once you have them, you can imagine doing some very interesting thing, like sort of joint inference, information propagation. For example, you saw all these amazing uh, technology advances, right? Despite all this, measuring protein at the genome scale is actually still very hard. So, um, but on the other hand, if you know the connection, uh, measuring messenger mRNA is trivial. So you could actually now backproc the, this kind of information if you know this knowledge connection. So this is just give you a simple intuition why this could be helpful. And in general, I like to think of this as a gigantic HMM, except that the backbone is a, is a graph, right? 
So obviously, um, I mean, this is, um, it, this is not uh, a, a really a, a very new idea. People in system biology have been trying to do this kind of thing. And for example, in graphical model, like Duffy Collar have been a pioneering, uh, 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 applying graphical model into this kind of genomic domain. Now, one of the, but if you talk to like biologists today, like this is not really the dominant mainstream approach. And one bottleneck is that how do you get by all these uh, kind of pathway connections, right? You need them to construct a model. So this basically uh, come to another sort of uh, 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 set of astonishing uh, numbers. So PubMap is like this online repository of biomedical papers. Um, and there were millions of papers already, but also every minute I'm speaking here, uh, there were two new papers popping up. And every year, there were like one million new papers. Uh, every day is thousands of papers. It's like every day is like triple AI, ICML, several conference combined. So it's not possible. Uh, by the way, uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime with questions. I would love that. Um, I would like this to be as interactive as possible. So obviously, we don't want to manually read them. It's not feasible. What we would love to do is like, um, if we can have automated this reading process, like do uh, automatically scan the PubMap text, and then each of these hyper edge actually translates are they are spelled out in maybe one sentence or one paragraph. And if we can just automate this whole process, then we can automatically construct this pathway graph, and then we can automatically convert that into a graphical model, and then start doing uh, all sorts of things like prediction, simulation, and so forth. So this so this would be a um, a uh, very desirable thing to do. So now, given the actual text, what do we want to do? We want to extract all this entity, right, uh, standard information thing, um, like protein, cell, and et cetera. But more importantly is that we want to extract what are the relation among this entity that this text is talking about. So for example, in this simple text, um, it's actually saying that this protein, GP41, can activate another protein, IL10, but crucially is that this activation is not happening in a vacuum. Uh, another protein, another kinase, actually uh, can modulate this activation. So this guy can serve as a meta switch to control this thing. So obviously, understanding this kind of nested uh, structure, this elaborate structure, are very important. Like imagining if I understand, oh, IL-10 is, is my driver, right? I want to target that. If you, don't, if you don't know the whole picture, you might say, oh, let's target this guy, ignoring this one, or maybe let's target this guy, ignoring this one, then, then your drug tend to, will tend to fail. So we really need to uh, get all this uh, complex knowledge out. And if you think about it, it's, it's basically like a semantic parsing problem. So um, uh, in syntax parsing, you want to get this noun phrase, word phrase. The only difference is here. Our non-terminal are just this semantic category, right? Like activation, inhibition, uh, theme, cause, and so forth. So why is it dif difficult? I guess for this audience, probably um, it doesn't, uh, uh, this is quite obvious. People are just so creative in figuring out a uh, different way to say the same thing, right? So here is just a simple way that, um, a bunch of ways that basically just saying the same thing like this protein, very important tumor suppressor, TP53, uh, inhibit BCL2, right? So, the, but there are a variety of things to, to write. So you can imagine, okay, let's sit down and write a semantic grammar, but that doesn't really scale. Um, you can then, okay, let's say, let's involve our machine learning uh, uh, instinct, right? Let's annotate some examples and then try to ch uh, chain your favorite uh, uh, extractor. So, so some people uh, in University of Tokyo, they basically pioneer, do a, a major pioneering effort to curate this uh, data set called Genia. And, and this is a really invaluable data set, and, and even to this day, it remains like the, the, the only major resource uh, with uh, all this uh, complex uh, pathway annotated. But when you look at the scale, unfortunately, it's like a tiny backdrop compared to the PubMap. It's, uh, the project lasted for, for over a decade. It's, it's very expensive, take a lot of time, lots of funding. Um, and so if you look at some of this abstract, most of them are you know, back in 1990 something. Also, it's a, it's a tiny subset 
of the entire biology is focused on this particular cell and this particular kind of transcription factor. So if tomorrow you want to work on lung and skin and so forth, then you start wonder maybe you're missing something. So this is not really, so this is not really saying, uh, I mean, this is sort of a common problem, not just the genia. Um, this is really a common curse for when you try to do this supervised approach. So, so naturally, we want to try to get some free lunch. So a bunch of you here actually already do a lot of great work like distribution similarity like, uh, and, and so forth. So um, what we have been uh, particularly interested in at this stage is that when you look at the biomedical domain, there are actually lots and lots of structure uh, information available. So at the entity level, we have almost complete uh, databases. Like gene doesn't, you don't discover 10 genes. We, are no, we already passed a stage where we discover like 10 genes, 100 genes each day. So it, it evolved very slowly. The pathway, even for pathway level, because it's very important. So people actually spend lots of effort uh, try to annotate them. Like NCI, for example, is a, a particular data set that um, they persuade a bunch of nature editor to try to repaper, curate the pathway. Unfortunately, this is very burdensome, so those people give up after two years. But, and when you look at those databases, inevitably, because of literature grow too fast, so once the database is constructed, it's almost immediately outdated, because there are tons of tons of new paper. But still, from a learning point of view, these are actually basically free lunch. What the database does, uh, give you are like something like TP53 could be an activate uh, inhibitor for for another protein. It doesn't directly give you annotated example like what we would like in NLP, right? Like this is a sentence, here is the event, uh, here is the argument, and so forth. So these are like indirect uh, information. But still, if we can leverage that, we can, we can potentially get something out of it. And the approach that we are trying to take is to sort of hallucinating that this semantic parse is actually always out there. Right? So imagining this semantic annotation is there. It's just latent. It's, we never observe it. Um, so, so then we can now imagining that to try to involve all our latent variable uh, 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 modeling machinery to try to crack this problem. So we call this grounded semantic parsing because it's trying to do semantic parsing, um, but uh, grounded into no knowledge base. So let me start with some simple uh, example, give you some motivation. So, um, um, so imagining you flatten this knowledge base into a simple uh, flat table, like you have this uh, column denote like whether it's activation or inhibition, and then you have this denoting the, the argument and so forth. So this line just saying TP53 inhibit BCL2. So this by itself doesn't uh, tell you where to look for the annotated example. But now imagining you pair this knowledge base with all this uh, uh, unlabeled text. And then because the entity are relatively easy to locate, right? Uh, because we have this uh, uh, very complete resource. So we can now start to see, oh, this protein actually appear here and also with this protein. So these two protein co-occur here. Now we can then say, OK, maybe then we can start to hypothesize maybe this guy is talking about these relations, right? So some of you, obviously, you could recognize this, uh, obviously, uh, this distance supervision that uh, actually some of you have also done uh, uh, excellent works here. And, but this is sort of the intuition, how you could ground into the database to try to do things. Now, one of the restrictions for most of the existing distance supervision is that it's limited into this classification scenario, right? Uh, if I have co-occurrence, I can pretend that this is an annotated example, and then you can train your SVM or whatever to do things. So when we try to do this, apply this to nested event, it's not directly applicable here, because what you need to get out are this complex semantic structure. So you need to do a structure prediction task here. So how can we do this? So we developed this uh, system we call uh, GUSP, so the grounded semantic parsing. So you can think of it as basically we're trying to generalize this distance supervision idea to be able to extract this kind of complex uh, nested event. And the major intuition here is to imagine the following, right? You basically try to hallucinate all possible semantic parses. But now if a particular parses, we compare that with the events that we know uh, in the knowledge base. If this parse 
uh, contain something that are compatible with an event in the knowledge base, then we will introduce a sort of baseline prior to try to uh, uh, put more favor, put more weight onto this parse. So you can think about this is basically a Bayesian learning with this kind of uh, prior that favor the semantic parsing parses compatible with the events. Um, so I will go into the detail, but the, but the promising side, obviously you don't expect you would get to the state-of-the-art supervised uh, result in one shot. But um, when we compare to the original sort of participant who has all the training and notation, we nevertheless actually outperform a, a lot of them, so which give us hope that this is potentially feasible. So how do we actually do this? So here is basically the, the input and output for the GUSP system. So the input are like, first of all, the unlabeled text, but also you can see this is basically the logical form, just a convoluted way to represent all those uh, nested events. Um, so imagining you have a database with all those nested events, imagining you have an unlabeled text and it's trying to learn a semantic parser to, to do this uh, pathway extraction. So how do we formalize this? We basically start with a syntactic parse, a dependency tree. Uh, for, uh, so for all the unlabeled sentences, we, we, we start with the dependency parse, and then we convert this general semantic parsing problem into basically annotating this semantic tree with sim, uh, uh, this syntactic tree with semantic categories. So each word we will annotate with a semantic category. Each edge we will annotate it with a semantic relation. And so, so you can think of this basically a tree HMM, a, a HMM with the tree backbone. So the parameterization is pretty straightforward. You have the emission probability. So if I saw this semantic category, right? and it, will, it's, it could admit this thing with certain probability. If I got this semantic relation, it could admit a particular dependency label with some probability. And we also have the transition probability. So if I have a parent semantic category, it will admit a trial semantic category with some probability, and likewise from here to here, and so forth. So with this formulation, uh, any questions? Yes. It's not CFG uh, per se because your tree is fixed. You are given the dependency tree. Um, so it's, I mean, it's HMM in the sense that you have uh, emission and transition. Um, so, but the backbone is not like a chain. Yeah, so between this guy to this guy, between this guy to this guy, and then between this guy to this guy, and this guy to this guy, and so forth. Any other questions? Um, so, so the advantage of doing this, uh, inference is very straightforward. Uh, inference is linear time, it's not, it's not CFG because you don't need to search the tree, so, so it's linear time in sentence. The majority of difficulty is actually in the learning. Well, at the outset, the learning is pretty standard EM, right? You, you basically, so here the T is a, a particular dependency tree, right? And then the Z is this semantic annotation. And so this part is pretty standard stuff, right? You sum out the Z, and then you try to maximize the likelihood of the observed uh, uh, trees. So this is a pretty standard EM, except that we have this K representing the knowledge base. And then we have this thing that is sort of libation prior. I will clarify what I mean by sort of. So this K is the knowledge base, and essentially what this guy do is that for each Z, you can basically throw to this function, and it will give you a score. It's basically weighting uh, this C. And the weighting is depending on whether the semantic parse uh, is compatible with some events uh, in the knowledge base. Right? So in the paper, you can find more uh, uh, form formal detail. So you can think of this as uh, very much like Bayesian prior, except that it's not put on the on the theta, right? This is the, what the standard way you put a patient prior. Instead, this is a prior that you put on the vari uh, variable assignment. So this actually date back to uh, Judy Pearl. Um, uh, he called this a virtual evidence. So the key challenge here is that if we don't have this guy, life is pretty good, right? You can just do dynamic programming. It's kind of like HMM because you can decompose it into this local factor. But with this guy, 
inherently you need to look at the whole parse to be able to tell whether this is meaningful compared to the knowledge base or not. So this guy basically rendered the whole thing uh, totally non-tractable. So what we do, you can find more detail in the paper, but one of the major technical challenges we face and we try to address in the paper is that we try to extend. So the main idea is that, so before you will see in this um, here, right? These are pretty straightforward semantic categories, right? Now what we do is that we try to extend, augment this semantic state so that we will not only capture that local semantic category, but we also sort of capturing everything under the partial tree so far. Everything that going on that might be relevant when we go up to see, okay, where do I see a bigger thing? Do I see a bigger thing? Um, so basically memorizing, you can imagine this C is like memorizing the partial semantic tree. So if we do that, obviously we can restore the dynamic programming. But on the other hand, the state space now quickly explodes, right? So the, the, the second thing we do is that we will basically introduce some approximation, and um, some of them are pretty general, and uh, some of them are actually, uh, uh, we use some of this kind of domain knowledge to do the simplification. So with all those uh, approximation, we, we then bring the state space uh, back down to the trackable uh, uh, region. So, um, so this is one of the main uh, sort of technical challenge. Another big f question that some of you might already be thinking is that, well, we all know that syntax, first of all, the syntactic parser could make lots of lots of errors. And secondly, even if the semantic par uh, syntactic parser is completely correct, because uh, it's serving a different purpose, right? So when you compare to a particular application sem semantic, the syntax and semantic may not uh, perfectly align, right? So for example, in this case, uh, this sentence is saying the ability of this protein to block another guy require another protein, right? So basically, um, this guy blocking this guy, but this, this whole event is governed by this thing. So what happened, what's wrong with this uh, uh, parse is that uh, when you look at uh, the ultimate semantic relation you want to extract, right? What you want is that you want this inhibition relation to have the cost argument of IL-10. So you want this guy to connect with this guy, but because of this sort of like kind of uh, empty meaning uh, noun, so this guy, these two guys are now separated. Another problem is that you also want this higher level event to connect to this event, but again, this guy, the ability really stand in the way, right? And this is not really uh, something that are uh, sort of exception. Uh, there were tons of tons of these cases, and also if you consider the actual parser output, there were lots of errors, so there were lots of this kind of misalignment uh, 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 applied, uh, uh, well, uh, in practice. So, so, so actually, if you step back and think a little bit about, uh, you look around and look at the dominant semantic parsing approach, right? Um, almost none of them re, uh, using syntactic parsers uh, as, the, as the basis to do semantic parsing. They often, it's like, they start training the sem semantic parser, like CCG or whatever, to learn both syntax and semantic from scratch. And, and this is one of the reasons, because they don't, they don't want to trust the syntactic parser because it may not completely align. But to me, the, prob the trouble is that this feel like a little bit like kind of throwing out the baby with the bath water because we make a lot of uh, uh, investment in the syntactic parsing. We have a lot of resource. So how can we bring it back into the table? Well, here is one of the attempt in this, uh, both in this work and also in a couple years ago in the, in the ACL paper when, when we do uh, question answering. We are trying to, the key idea here is that let's try to, again, amend this semantic state because the main problem here is that these two guys are, uh, are separated, right? So if we can amend the semantic state so that we can somehow bring them back uh, close to each other, then we, we effectively sort of uh, 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 alleviate the problem. So in particular, for example, this is a linguistically motivated um, um, uh, state that's called racing, and what it does is that it's basically saying the parent should have the semantic state 
that are consistent with one of the trial. So effectively, this guy doesn't have his own independent semantic, but really borrow the semantic from one of the trial. Um, so, um, so now, imagining if we have this semantic state at our hand, then we can now bring both this guy to here. Uh, we can connect them together, and we can also connect these two guys together. And now we can, we can basically address uh, this uh, semantic uh, problem. So realize that this thing is not like hard-coded rule or anything. We just simply introduce this kind of state uh, that, that, that the, HM, uh, the, 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 par, the parser grammar can use. So we introduce this racing state for the relation. We introduce this uh, race version of uh, uh, any of the semantic state. So the parser can choose to use it or choose not to use it. And, and we have a complexity prior to say, don't hallucinate unnecessarily. Obviously, you don't want to do that, right? But why this uh, state might be potentially be bring up is be picked up is because like because of that. Remember that virtual evidence, right? So if in the knowledge base I do see an event that involving this uh, these players, right? By introducing this, uh, by by interpreting, by adopting this particular parse, then I can get a reward from that virtual evidence. So if that reward outweighs the complexity prior, then then the semantic parse will pick pick this up. So so this is um, this is sort of uh, what what's happening behind the end. So now um, so we basically pick the genius to to evaluate because then we can actually have a complete ground truth. So this table can give you some idea how difficult this task uh, is. So this is uh, basically a breakdown performance of the best supervised. Uh, yes. Very good point. So, um, so you can imagine uh, ultimately, right? You you can have two kinds of evaluation. Like ultimately, what biology care are sort of type-based evaluation, right? Do I get the right type like TP53 in BCL? You can imagine it. That's ultimately what they care about, right? So here, this evaluation, particular evaluation, including this whole genius shared task, this is a more like the standard NLP evaluation. So in fact, that's what I'm trying to uh, say. Why this number, right? You look at this F1. You look at it. It's like 55. It, it's simply uh, low. But here is the task is very difficult because you would need to get all this thing right. You need to get here is the trigger word for this uh, activation event, and here is the theme argument which are undergo the change. Here's the cost argument, right? And also, this evaluation is very stringent because of all this nested event. So they make this evaluation quite stringent because imagine you have a nested tree. This is like a goal, right? And if your system get most of it right, but it mess up some of the kind of descendant node, then this will actually render all the ancestor event to be considered incorrect. So, so this is partially why um, this, this number is, is, is somewhat low. Um, but but that's also how we actually evaluate and and uh, I'm sorry. Yeah yeah yeah. So so this number is like how many tree is the F1 for for the tree that are actually uh, accurately uh, recover. Yeah. So and and then so these are sort of uh, so the event they have different type of events right. So the pathway you can see is pretty uh, uh, complex. So basically, uh, the first five event types, they are sort of like a simple event type, right? They can only take one argument. So for example, expression, just saying, OK, this guy uh, actually, uh, uh, this gene actually, uh, we saw the proteins for the gene. And the transcription is just like uh, this gene, and we saw the mRNA, and so forth. Um, and, and these four event types are the more complex one, like binding is like two protein bind together to form a complex. Uh, and regulation is the one that you saw earlier, like A, uh, activate B, and so forth. So, so these are sort of the breakdown. So you can see the simple one, not surprisingly, perform better. The, the difficulty are more here. And also because of the, the nested evaluation reason. So if you mess up some of this guy, even if you get the upper level right, and you still get considered wrong. So in any case, uh, this is a difficult task. Um, so initially, when we just throw Gatsby without any other things, right? 
So what we saw is that, well, the result is uh, definitely uh, not very good. But on the other hand, if you consider how little information, remember, we don't have any annotation, right? We only have the, the abstract uh, event tree in the database. We don't know where they come from. We don't know how they match the actual sentence. So we have a very indirect uh, supervision. So this is still sort of encouraging because we seem to actually still learn something. But another thing is that when we look at this uh, breakdown, it's actually very informative. Because you can see earlier, it's like, this guy actually pretty easy, um, but here we are doing pretty bad here. And when we, look, when we look at them and we think a little bit, it's actually pretty e uh, obvious why this happened. It's because this kind of event, because they are simple, they have only one argument. So now imagining if in the database you saw like TP53 expression, right? And now every time I see TP53, maybe you talk about something else, right? But every time I see TP53, the virtual evidence we try to hallucinate. Is this an expression? Is this an expression? Is this an expression, right? So there is no other way to kind of counter that, that hallucination. So, so that, this hurt a simple event, and then nastily it will hurt uh, everything else. So this now motivates us to think about how can we actually um, uh, counter this problem, but also, on the other hand, we don't want to annotate. Example, that's the expensive part. So it turns out that you don't have to annotate uh, example in detail, right? Because that's the expensive part. But if you ask a biology, right? You can say, okay, abstractly, right? What will you uh, represent an uh, expression event, right? What word will you use to denote expression event? They will say, okay, no problem, right? Express, you know, something, right? And then for, uh, for example, for, for uh, positive regulation, they will tell you, okay, activate, induce, increase, and so forth. So they can easily give you a few words that are pretty commonly used to represent a particular event type. Um, that is actually an uh, easy effort. So we basically combine this uh, prototype-driven learning um, 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 one of the first papers done by Arik Hagigi and Dan Klein. So essentially, we try to simulate what the biology will give us. Like we want to say, we ask the biology, give me five prototype words for each event type. So in this experiment, we basically simulate this process by saying, uh, we're looking at the training uh, data and we count how many, uh, the, f the frequency for the trigger word, we just picked the five most frequent one. So just for the reason to simulate this thing, in reality, that could also happen with uh, biology too. So what we can see is actually a very encouraging increase, like you can see now this simple event actually pre performed quite decently uh, as it should be. And also, um, and that also helped the complex event. And in the end, we got like 40. Obviously, there is still a big gap from the supervised uh, 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 result. Uh, that's understandable. But when you sort of compare to other supervised approach in, in the shared tasks, which have access to all these things, we are actually not doing uh, 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 really bad. Uh, we, we are actually doing uh, uh, competitively, relatively. Um, so also another thing you might start to wonder is that when we try to run this on the wild, obviously we want to run this on PubMed. We don't want to just uh, do it, evaluate on Genia. And now in the real case, the knowledge base and the text are not that perfectly aligned, right? So you might, your knowledge base typically are incomplete. And, and, and so would this uh, drastically cripple the performance, so we've done a bunch of experiments to measure how this mismatch uh, uh, impact. So for example, this is one particular experiment, like oh, suppose we just have 10% of the knowledge, 10% uh, of the event, or 50% of the event, and we vary the pro proportion of the text, that uh, unlabeled text we give it, right? So uh, we can see that, not surprisingly, the fewer the, the, the event, the fewer the text, you perform uh, uh, less well, but but the thing doesn't immediately collapse, right? And it, it actually increased quite nicely. So this gave, gave us some sign that this, this approach is actually relatively robust. And you can find more experiment in the paper. Um, so, so, so this is this particular uh, piece of work. We try to generalize this distance supervision to extract this kind of complex knowledge. Ultimately, what we want to do, obviously, is to um, scale to the pub map, and then uh, we want to serve uh, biologists, right? So we create this cloud-based uh, 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 web services so you can explore this uh, uh, um, 
uh, interaction uh, even now. And you could also, uh, we also provide web services so that imagining tomorrow somebody want to do an analytic, a bigger analytic pipeline, they can incorporate this into uh, uh, their pipeline. So we call this thing literum. Uh, it's uh, uh, sort of the OME for the literature. Um, uh, there is actually nowadays probably hundreds of OME in the PubMed. Uh, we figure uh, why not another one. Um, so, and then another thing is that we don't we don't wait for this whole thing to become perfected. Um, uh, we are imagining uh, this can already potentially be useful uh, even at the premise scale. So we scan the power map and then uh, make that available. We already have some pretty exciting uh, kind of quote unquote like customer who, who actually start to find uh, Litterum useful. Um, and so one of the longer term sort of aspiration or, or things that I find really exciting about is this sort of vision of machine science for sort of automating scientific discovery, right? Just like machine learning and machine reading. So these days, I mean, everybody knows big data, but we shouldn't forget that we also have this very rich knowledge uh, base uh, and not, uh, all this rich uh, ontology structure and so forth. And if we combine the two together, we can build really deep models. And those models can actually allow us to come up with hypotheses and then uh, that can potentially even dry automated experiment. In biology, especially in genomic these days, experiment is actually all the sequencing are, are, are done by robots, right? So that, that's how they can be so cheap. Um, so we can now imagine we can automate a lot of this process to, to basically go all the way from the original data and knowledge to new uh, experiment, to new data and new knowledge, and eventually to update the model. And then the robot can say, here is what I feel like the most uncertain about, so you can even emulate the scientist, right? So here is the area we can have the most biggest impact. Uh, and, and then we can kind of uh, raise the productivity of scientists. So, so some of the concrete things uh, to do, uh, uh, sort of my wish list, is like, for example, Instead of extracting, so every biology I talk to, uh, biologists I talk to, they say, don't just extract the pathway. You have to tell me, is this a lung cell? Is this a, a skin cell? Because they could have very different wiring. Um, so we want to extract all this rich uh, contextual knowledge. And that's actually also make this kind of semantic grammar uh, uh, parsing approach more attractive because you can easily incorporate all this aspect into the joint model. And also you can even hope that not only are you solving a complex, uh, more complex problem, but actually this complexity can potentially help you because there are some information come from different modality can actually do the joint inference and, and help mutually disambiguate things um, and also hedging and so forth. Um, but also we want to go one more step is like, don't just extract the knowledge, but put them into the model, right? So if you look at all the extracted pathway from the palm map, you can see tons of tons of uh, inconsistencies, right? Uh, one day this guy said A activate B, the other guy published in that paper A inhibit B, right? How do we interpret this thing? And, and there was lots of contradiction there. And some of them actually have legitimate reasons. Some of them are probably error and so forth. So can you put a coherent model to uh, um, uh, resolve them? But also even more excitingly, it's like even thinking from a social perspective is that can we collectively, like NIH or NSF probably would love this kind of thing, like can we say how should I invest my next big funding money? Well, for example, we do a, in, in one of our uh, paper that I showed you earlier, we just scan the whole pub map. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, we then look at the pathway, right? We just uh, using pathway number, uh, unique pathway number as a proxy to see uh, how much research has been done on different cancer subtypes. And you see actually a big disparity between different subtypes. And some of them actually are not really correlated with the actual healthcare burden. Like some cancer type, just because there's a huge advocacy, there were tons of money, and whereas other also very serious one don't get enough one. So you can potentially also identify those. But the, but the last thing is actually the most exciting part is that can we actually do something uh, at the downstream to actually impact, so really connect with the, the biology, right? So we have actually this day tons of tons of this omics data, like pop, even public. So you can now start to play with them 
and, uh, and, and eventually like prioritizing drug combination and so forth. So one of the concrete things that we started doing, I feel very fortunate, to start collaborating with the Oregon Health and Science, um, uh, particularly with Brian Juker's group on this, uh, uh, on this beat AML project, this is a particular type of leukemia. Um, so so uh, 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 Brian is like the co-inventor of Gleewe, which is some of you might know this is like uh, uh, the first sort of uh, um, very successful targeted treatment that that um, and and now it's also uh, make lots of money for now um, so what we hope to um, what we hope to eventually build is this kind of end-to-end -end decision support uh, uh, pipeline so nowadays sequencing is pretty routine right uh, there is still some open problem but more or less it's like commoditized and so forth and um, and this is the part we really want to get to, right? The cycle, like we want to, uh, for example, we can prioritize drug combination, uh, give it to the physician, they can put it into a panel and run it on actual patient data and tell us, okay, this 45 things doesn't work, but this guy seemed very promising. And then we go back to revise the model. And NLP can potentially play a very big part in extracting this knowledge graph to support this, uh, uh, um, uh, decision support, so I sort of scratch uh, some of the basic idea. So for example, imagining that some patient comes in uh, and then you can see, okay, there was some mutation uh, in some of the gene, but you can now incorporate a network to tell, okay, this gene, uh, this mutation seem to be more important than some of the other mutation. And the reason is because when you look at the pathway connection, you can see this guy is sort of a, a central uh, there were a bunch of mutation uh, uh, surrounding it, and so this seems like actually what the cancer is targeting to perturb. And ultimately, what we want to do, obviously, is that, okay, given two drugs, right, can we prioritize, like, this combo probably will work, and also show the biologists and say, here are their direct targets, but also uh, realize that these are also their indirect targets, and there are the sort of downstream uh, things and then uh, why we think this combo is actually important and so forth. So, so we are basically working along this line and these are just like uh, kind of sneak peek uh, uh, what we are doing. So to conclude, uh, let's sort of like look at the sort of really big picture is like in genomic medicine, the really exciting time for computer science uh, is, is like things actually become uh, more and more digital. Right? If you look at the input, right, uh, uh, genome, uh, everything, they are already uh, digitized. But more excitingly is that even the medicine, even the output, the delivery mechanism, now become actually increasingly possible to be digital. So if you talk to biologists today, everybody is crazy about CRISPR. It's basically a, a very efficient way to edit the genome. So you could edit some bad gene out and activate some uh, really good genes in. Um, so now you can imagine, eventually, we don't have to wait for the, the locks and chemistry try millions of small molecules, right? We can just say, at least for genetic disease, at least we can potentially say, okay, you have this uh, cancer, so you need to suppress these three genes, activate these two genes. So with something like CRISPR, like somewhere down the road, you could actually realize this uh, part. Now, what you actually are missing still is from this input to the output, right? So how do we come up with this set of recommendation? And if you think about it, it's basically a digital problem. And, and we could potentially have some uh, impact contribution there. So to, to recap, precision medicine is a very exciting uh, thing uh, these days. And I show you like this uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 dream to kind of uh, do this kind of system modeling and uh, we can show that we can see that pathway could potentially be useful to provide a knowledge graph and I show you the literum. Uh, I can't, obviously I can't do all, uh, all this thing without all uh, the amazing collaborators. So uh, in particular, I'm a co-PI in a DARPA grant called Big Mechanism, which actually have a lot of overlap with what I talk about uh, these days. And this is uh, led by Andrew Ryszewski at Chicago. Uh, we've been working with, uh, on the BDML project with OHSU in Berkeley. 
some people starting using Litherum and provide us a lot of feedback and use case and motivation. And of course, I, um, it's, it's with all these wonderful colleagues at uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't really do uh, all of this thing. So uh, thank you, and um, I'm happy to answer more questions. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late, but perhaps. So, so Ben told me that uh, because Jason is not here, so, so there are not that many questions. So <laughs> that seemed to be the case. <laughs> I am missing Jason now. Very good, very good. I, I, I'm so glad you asked this question. It's like, Perfect. Yep. All right. per per perfect question. So 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 that's actually something I wish I would, can have time to talk and 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 so everybody will ask us like how good is good enough, <clears throat> right? Is fifty percent F one is good enough? Ninety percent you have to wait for ninety percent. So here is what I imagine. <clears throat> Is is really that really depends on what you want to do? It's really alluded to when you mentioned recall. That's exactly what we are imagining. Because, like, what we first of all, uh, what do we want to use this knowledge base for? You can imagine it's just a prior, right? It's just basically the the problem with uh, this space is like you have twenty thousand genes when you consider all combinations, just too many, right? So this knowledge graph is just like uh, sort of prioritize your search space. To, to, to limit it. So from that point of view, that recall, high recall, and reasonable position is actually uh, pretty good enough. And, and also, that actually alleviates the concern that because of all this contra contradiction and so forth, so, so um, you, you may not trust individual annotation, right? But when you combine that with the ultimate, the data, right? The ultimately, you subject it to say, OK, I come up with this prediction. You run it to to a drug, right? It either kills the cancer cell or not. So so that part is objective. So you you it, it, so so that give you a very uh, um, so so basically then uh, all you need is like uh, a reasonable sort of constraining the search space. And also you asked about like, I guess you are thinking about like token based versus uh, type based, right? I think. I think um, so. Whether you want to, so I think for particular uh, biologists, like when they see a particular statement, right, they want to see some provenance. Definitely, they wouldn't trust you to take it for, for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ultimately, the more the merrier. The, the more complete you want, the, the merrier. And, and that's actually the argument for NLP, right? If you, just, if you know beforehand, I just want to know BCL2, then it's doable, right? I just ask 100 friends to just collect the knowledge base. But now the problem is that it doesn't scale to 20,000 genes. So the, I would say the more complete, the better. And in cancer, um, if you can look at some of the famous, actually, that's a, 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 a Wagon's team here actually published that paper uh, we, along with a bunch of other people to look at the landscape of the, the cancer landscape. So it's, a, it's a actually an incredibly long tail distribution. So you can see a, a something like TPP3 occur in like 50% of the tumors. But then you can see a lot of things like 2%, 1%, 5%. We know that a bunch of them could be the driver, but we don't know which one. So, so you, you, that's why what I mean by you want to be as uh, complete as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, even at that level, you will get lots and lots of junk. Like uh, you will have you will have sentences that talk about a long list of protein, right? They they just conjun- conjunction and something. You can imagine filtering some of them out, but then but then um, uh, and another thing that you will miss here, obviously, is the direction. The direction is uh, actually very important, right? Like imagining you want to. Uh, what do you mean by bind? Well, but but then but then you are not talking about one edge. You're talking about many many edge. So now when you multiply those many many binary decisions, it's an exponential space, right? So so and the direction is very important because like targets, right? Like you want the target to drug target to influence the driver. You don't want the driver to influence your target, right? So so that's one thing you would miss there. Um, but this correlation thing is actually what people have been using in the past because that's what they have, right? So, for example, like in Duffin Collins' early work, like she basically tried to. You can basically think of it as like you you learning this Bayesian networks from scratch. You do this structure learning from scratch by looking at this correlation between pair of genes. And if this has high correlation, this is exactly your intuition, right? It's how complicated can that be, right? Either binary, right, one direction or the other. So, so then you can do this kind of greedy way to try to learn things. Um, but this approach didn't scale that well. You can imagine, like greedy, you can easily uh, local optima. Uh, so they have some very exciting work um, in science and follow up, but 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 the gene number is very small. Like you, <laughs> well, exponential can do a lot of damage, right? <laughs> okay, thank you.